Hi, everyone. Uh, now that's after the midterm, we're going to um, shift gears and now go to a different organ system, which is the digestive system. In this first lecture, uh, we're going to begin talking about the alimentary canal. Uh, and then in subsequent lectures, we'll talk more about these more specific organs. Uh, we'll also mention today the accessory organs of the digestive system. So, so this in this first lecture, we're going to identify the major parts of the alimentary canal. We'll mention the accessory organs, and we'll, we'll outline the histology of the alimentary canal. Uh, we're going to find that this basic plan will be modified uh, throughout the rest of the uh, digestive system. Uh, we'll, we'll mention the peritoneum, and we'll talk about uh, the first part of the alimentary canal, including the mouth, uh, salivary glands, and the esophagus. So if we, if we can break down the digestive system into a simple sentence, uh, this is what probably the minimal statement we can say that the, that the digestive system does. It's a mechanical and chemical breakdown of food so nutrients can be absorbed into the bloodstream. So the whole point is for us to get the nutrients from our, our, our diet. In order to do that, we have to uh, not only break them down mechanically, so they go from big things to little things, but also chemically break them down so that we can absorb them into the bloodstream. The digestive system can be divided into two types of organs. We have the alimentary canal, also known as the gastrointestinal or GI or digestive tract, and the accessory organs. The organs of the alimentary canal include the oral cavity or mouth, the pharynx or throat, the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine. Okay, we'll cover about the first half uh, of these this, uh, in this particular lecture. And here are the uh, kind of rough uh, identification of them, the oral cavity or mouth, the pharynx or throat, the esophagus is a long tube, the stomach, uh, and the small and large intestine. So these are the, these are the uh, primary organs of the digestive system. We also have what's called the accessory organs because they're not part of the alimentary canal, but they still assist in digestion. <clears throat> so things, this includes things like your teeth, your tongue, your salivary glands, your liver, gallbladder, and the pancreas. And here is this is a, a, a figure showing the lo relative location of the uh, of these uh, accessory organs. Now. It, 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 the elementary canal is like a long tube, and so I'll show you in the next figure, kind of make which makes it a little more uh, 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 illustrated that this really is a long tube. Okay, so here I removed everything else, and so now that we just see just the digestive system alone, we can see it's a long tube. Now I I, I sat in one lecture on this uh, a long time ago. And the instructor made the analogy that the digestive system is much like one of those car washes where you drive your car through. What happens is, as you drive your car through, you know your car is sprayed and spritzed uh, with different things, and it's it's physically uh, buffed and washed, uh, as well as chemicals treated. And much similarly, we're going to find out that the digestive system is is like that as well, where there's going to be things that are going to change uh, uh, the, the food or the bolus that's passing through the digestive system uh, uh, as it passes from uh, the beginning to the end of the digestive system. The major difference is the end product. Instead of a shiny new car, we don't uh, we, we have our waste products that are not digested. Now, there are Six basic digestive functions we can we can uh, uh, define. Okay, and I made this handy dandy table for you. In the first column, 
uh, we have the one through six, we have the process, and then we have kind of the minimal description of the function. So the six processes are ingestion, which is the uh, bringing food into the digestive system by, via the mouth. And that's the, usually the normal way of getting our nutrition. The second is secretion. Secretion can be both endocrine through hormones or through exocrine, such as mucus, enzymes, and acids. And these secretions help to aid digestion. Propulsion is the movement of food and liquids by peristalsis. So we're going to learn about peristalsis as the, say the rhythmic muscular contractions <clears throat> to move the food from one end of the digestive system to the other. Four is digestion. So it's interesting that even though it's called the digestive system, digestion is only one component of the different functions of uh, the digestive system. And we mentioned earlier that digestion is the mechanical and chemical breakdown of food. Okay. But this is required uh, for the next step, which is probably one of the most important, is absorption. And this is the movement of nutrients through the alimentary canal wall into the blood or lymphatic vessels. So this really becomes part of us. Okay. While it's still in the alimentary canal, anything there is not really uh, part of our body yet. Finally, not everything is digested and absorbed, and we have defecation. And so this is the exit of feces composed of non-digestible or unusable materials in the body. So this is the, to continue our analogy, this is the, would have been the shiny new car in our car wash story. Now, these six processes are all important, but they're not listed in order. Okay, so it's, it's just a, uh, 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 some of the processes occur uh, at different times during the digestive process. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on histology, but what's the thing unique about the alimentary canal is how the histology changes. So we're going to do, spend some time to show what the basic outline looks like. And then as we talk about the different uh, tissues and organs, we'll see how it changes. So this, is, this first part is pretty important because uh, you might get lost later on when we start telling you what's different. So the histology of the alimentary canal includes four layers. Okay, uh, the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and the serosa or adventitia layer. So here's uh, an illustration showing the different layers. So the inner layer is mucosa, then the submucosa, muscularis externa, serosa. Now you got to keep in mind that uh, uh, the alimentary canal is a tube that the, the opening of the tube, the lumen, is not part of our, our body. It's considered outside of our body. And so when I think of submucosa, I always think within the mucosa. But since it's a tube, the submucosa is external to the mucosa. Okay? So the mucosa layer has three parts. The epithelium, and the lamina propria, and the muscular mucosa. Okay. And so again, these are showing the three layers of the mucosa layer. Now, external to that is a submucosa layer. And this is composed of dense irregular connective tissue. It includes the submucosa plexa of the enteric nervous system. Remember, the enteric nervous system is a component of the autonomic nervous system, separate from the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. And here's the submucosa layer. Muscularis externa, uh, most parts of the uh, digestive system has two muscle, smooth muscle layers uh, regulated by the myonteric plexus. There's the inner circular layer and the outer longitudinal layer. Okay, so circular meaning, meaning the, uh, if you're looking at the lumen, the fibers are going this way. Okay, uh, and the outer longitudinal layers, uh, these are going this way. And then here's the tube here. Okay, so the inner circular layer and the outer longitudinal layer. Now, the outermost layer can be either called a serosa or adventitia. And it all depends with, if it's within or uh, outside the peritoneal cavity. We call it a serosa if it's within the peritoneal cavity. 
And it's also, the serosis is also known as the visceral peritoneum, which is simple squamous epithelium uh, with loose connective tissue. The adventitia is the out, outside the cavity and is composed of dense, irregular connective tissue. Okay, so here we're showing the serosa. And different parts of the uh, 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 different organs will have either a serosa or adventitia depending on its anatomical location. Uh, the peritoneal membranes. Okay, you learn similar membranes in other parts of the body. So remember that uh, uh, these membranes uh, uh, are around those organs that are moving. Like, from, uh, like for example, you had the pericardial membrane in the heart. Okay, and in the in the respiratory system, uh, you've you've had a different membrane uh, surrounding the lungs. Okay. But here in the digestive system, we have the peritoneal membranes. Okay, but the individual na names are very similar. They have the outer parietal and the inner visceral peritoneum. And just like the other membranes, it's a, it's a it's a it's a membrane that folds over, forming a double membrane. Okay, the inner one is the visceral, and the outer is the parietal with the peritoneal cavity in between them. And so, the, so we said the peritoneal cavity is between the two membranes. And we can describe different organs uh, uh, of the abdominal cavity as being intraperitoneal or retroperitoneal. So organs within the peritoneal cavity are intraperitoneal. Organs outside the peritoneal cavity are retroperitoneal. And the organ can, can be exclusively one or the other, or it can be a combination of both, as we will see. Okay. So again, the peritoneal cavities is within uh, the peritoneum. So retroperitoneal will be outside of it. Let's begin our, 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 our discussion of the, uh, the, the digestive tract. The first is the oral cavity. Okay. It contains gums or gingiva teeth and tongue. It includes hard and soft palate, which is covered by stratified squamous epithelium. You learned uh, probably in SCB 203 that the uvula blocks the nasal cavity during swallowing. Okay. So that little punching bag here is the uvula, and it prevents food from entering the nasal cavity. And here are these other structures. I don't want to belabor the, 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 about the teeth, but I guess we should mention them. Uh, because their, their, their function is for the mechanical digestion and for chewing or masticating food. And you have three types of teeth. You have incisors, canines, uh, as well as molars, which can be premolars or molars. Okay. So you probably learned these if you took a, like a high school health class. Uh, we should mention the deciduous teeth are the primary baby teeth that fall out. And they include 20 teeth. Four incisors, two canines, and four molars in each jaw. Okay, so these are the primary teeth. The secondary teeth are the permanent teeth, and we have 32 permanent teeth, uh, four incisors, two canines, and up to six molars in each jaw. Okay, and here are the secondary teeth. The tongue. You don't really think about it, but your tongue is important, not only for digestion, but also for speaking. And the tongue is skeletal muscle covered with stratified squamous epithelium, which makes sense because uh, we sometimes we burn our tongues on very hot things. And so if it wasn't for the stratified squamous epithelium, you know, we'd be in a lot more pain than if it was not a simple squamous epithelium. So here's our tongue. Okay. Salivary glands are three pairs, uh, we have three pairs that secrete saliva. Okay, these include the parotid, submandibular, and sublingual. Okay, so the so two of them are e kind of easy to remember where they're located by their name. And the, the first one is easy because it is the largest. So the parotid gland is right in front of the ear, and it's the largest one. And it produces uh, 25 to 30% of the saliva. Okay, the sublingual gland is underneath the tongue, produces 5% of the saliva. <clears throat> The submandibular gland 
is beneath the jaw, it produces 65 to 70% of the saliva. So what is saliva? <coughs> well, or what's the function of saliva? Well, it moistens and lubricates and cleanses the oral mucosa. Okay, so, so it keeps your mouth wet uh, and keeping it clean. It's going to aid in mechanical digestion. The next time you eat something, think about what your tongue is doing. You don't really have to think about it. Your tongue is manipulating the food and moving it around your mouth to, 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 to help moisten it and getting it ready to swallow. So it mixes the food into what's called a bolus. For some reason, uh, a bolus is the only time I ever use this word is during digestion. So this little moist ball of food is called a bolus and getting ready to be swallowed. And it actually begins to dissolve the molecules. It has some enzymes, and it also dissolves not only for chemical digestion, but also for to stimulate taste receptors. So what is saliva composed of? Well, the primary, the three primary components are water, okay, electrolytes like sodium, chloride, potassium, and mucus. Okay, so those are the three big ones. It's also composed of an enzyme called salivary amylase. Okay, so we'll, later on we'll talk about this. Remember, it, you learned in SCB203 that anything with an ASC at the end is an enzyme. Lysozyme. Okay, so this is going to help uh, 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 lice bacteria. It has, uh, you learn in SCB203 that saliva contains uh, antibodies, specifically IgAs. And it also is buffered by bicarbonate ions. So this is probably the few times I'll be writing it out. Probably from now on, I'll be using the chemical formula of bicarbonate. OK. So uh, I, have, I made a little handy dandy table here showing you the, the minor components of saliva and its function. So salivary amylase begins polysaccharide digestion. So even in your mouth, uh, 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 polysaccharides begin uh, chemically being digested. So for example, uh, if you eat a cracker very slowly, you might feel it start tasting sweeter. You know, but normally we just swallow before we can, uh, uh, we're aware of that. Lysozyme breaks up bacterial plasma membranes, so this helps cleaning the oral cavity. And it's, it's composed of IgA, which will bind antigens on pathogens, so it has an immune function. Now the bicarbonate said was a buffer, and if you remember what a buffer is, it, it will neutralize stomach acid that may enter the esophagus. Okay. Uh, just to make relations to what we learned already, the submandibular and sublingual glands are innervated by the facial nerve and the product glands by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay. Now, posterior, uh, posterior to the nasal oral cavities and superior to the esophagus is the pharynx or the throat. Okay. You mentioned that you mentioned this or you learned about this in SCP203 when you learned about the respiratory system. And you learned that the pharynx has three parts: the nasal pharynx, which and the oral pharynx and the laryngopharynx. The nasal pharynx is the only one that's exclusively part of the respiratory system. The oral and laryngopharynx, you learn that it's shared between the respiratory system and the digestive system because we have both air, food, and water in both of these latter two structures. So here we have the, uh, 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 not labeled here is the nasal pharynx, then we have the oral pharynx, and then the laryngopharynx. So only the oral pharynx and laryngopharynx are part of the digestive system. And they're both lined with stratified, stratified squamous epithelium. Okay. So again, uh, even though I say this, it's also part of the uh, respiratory system. Okay. So posterior, to the, uh, posterior uh, to the trachea is a muscular tube called the esophagus. And pretty much that's what it is, just a tube to get from the uh, pharynx to the stomach. And it's lined with stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, 
It carries many esophageal glands, the sphincter mucus, to the great esophagus. So it slides right down during the muscular contractions. And what's interesting is the esophagus is not, uh, the histology is, uh, differentiates as you go from the superior end to the inferior end. The superior third of the, muscular, uh, of the muscularis externa, which we talked about in the histology, contains skeletal muscle. Okay. The middle third is a mixture of both skeletal and smooth muscle, and the inferior third is only smooth muscle. So based on your knowledge, you can say the superior, superior third is more under voluntary control, and then as you go inferior, you have less and less voluntary, voluntary control and more involuntary control. Okay, so here on this figure here is showing the histology of the esophagus and uh, next to the location of uh, uh, different levels of the esophagus. And this little square here is showing that it has both skeletal and smooth muscle in the muscular, muscularis externa. The esophagus has uh, valves or sphincters at either end. Okay. We have the upper esophageal sphincter that separates the pharynx and the esophagus. So uh, it allows food to pass through, but not easily to go backwards. But if you've ever ha 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 vomited or thrown up, you know that we can bypass uh, the sphincter. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And so here's the upper es esophageal sphincter. Okay, and uh, at this point it's uh, under a, vo a vo voluntary phase. Okay, the tug pushes the bolus posteriorly toward the oral pharynx, and this is under conscious control. So you have the ability to decide: Do I want to swallow it or not to swallow it? Okay. You also have the gastroesophageal sphincter, which separates the esophagus and the stomach, and of course it prevents the stomach contents from re-entering the esophagus. And so here's the gastroesophageal sphincter as you're exiting the esophagus and entering the stomach. Again, these are to prevent from uh, the bolus from uh, reversing. <clears throat> 